What is life? The question is the undisputed king of all rhetorical questions. There are many answers to it and none, for life refuses to be caged in conceptual categories. The same is true of all things fundamental to existence, consciousness, time, infinity and so on. There are many theories that try to define them but none can really succeed. At the most primordial level, being alive is a feeling. If the feeling is one of gratitude, then it places a burden of debt on our consciousness and obligates us to act in a way that the debt is repaid, at least in part. Then there is desire, the driving force behind all creation, which also provokes us to act in a way that produces desired results. The fulfillment of desire is also its extinguishment, its destruction. The ritual of Bali or sacrifice seeks to reconcile what the mind sees as opposing forces, death to the gods and human desire. Destruction is an integral part of the ritual. Too abstract? Let me simplify it for you. The Hindu view of life is one that places the burden of debt or rina on human beings for merely existing. We owe our existence to our ancestors, pitras, to the panchabhutas, environment, to the rishis, to fellow human beings and to the gods. Vedic yagyas are rituals designed to repay our debt to the gods. As Hinduism evolved over the millennia, tantrika methods of worship became popular and the core act of the yagya, that is the offering of Bali, began to be carried out independently, outside of the context of yagya as well. It goes without saying that we offer to the gods what they like, not what we approve of. Let me elaborate. The Hindu concept of deities differs significantly from the Abrahamic concept of a monotheistic god. A deity is a divine personality with its own likes and dislikes. Accordingly, Vishnu likes Tulsi and Shiva prefers Belpatra, not the other way around. Every ritual, every ingredient used in Upasana is based on the preferences of the individual Devata and is hence sacredly inviolable. An innocuous question that is asked by those who have shallow knowledge of the subtleties of Hindu Upasana Paddhati is, what would happen if one offered Tulsi to Shiva instead of Belpatra? Of course, nothing will happen except that the Upasana will remain unsuccessful and bear no fruit. But how do we, mere mortals, know which deity likes what? We rely on the Shastras because they were written by Siddhas and Gurus who had perfected a given method of Upasana and then clearly recorded for future generations how each path must be traversed. The Hindu practice of Pashubali has been continuously under the assault of the secular establishment of India. For example, a few years ago, the Tripura High Court issued an order banning the practice of Pashubali in the iconic Chipur Sundari Mahavidya temple as well as all other Hindu places of worship in the state. What is alarming is that many ordinary Hindus appear to favor this ban. The reason for the prevailing attitude is simple. Hindus, in the absence of formal education in dharma, have acquired a largely protestant worldview even in matters of religion and simply fail to comprehend the meaning and significance of Pashubali. Today, most animal sacrifices are performed in Shakta temples like the Tripur Sundari temple where the Kalikula methods of worship are prevalent. Modern sensibilities are easily offended by anything beyond rational, so there is a tendency among people to rationalize the esoteric. Some say that a mother cannot approve of taking the life of an animal and thus deny the very scriptures that describe the divine in the form of a mother. Now let's see what are the Tantric and Vedic injunctions on Pashubali. Tantric texts are like how-to books for sadhakas and they unequivocally sanction Bali without which some specific Devata Upasana is never complete. In fact, there is a list of Devatas classified as Bali Devatas or those who love offerings of Bali. In one praise to the Mahashakti in the form of Ugratara, the Devi is referred to as Bali Homa Priya meaning one who loves Bali and Homa. A stotra to Devi Kamakya from the Yogini Tantra describes her as Chagabali Tushta, meaning one who is happy with the sacrifice of goats. 
Even the widely famed Devi Mahatyam or Chandipat, which is arguably the most cardinal text of Shakti Upasana, records in the 12th chapter this verse where the Mahadevi speaks to the devotees. I will accept with love the Bali and Puja that are offered and the fire offering that is done likewise, whether they are performed with the due knowledge of sacrifice or not. In the Kalika Puran, there is a section called Rudhiradhyaya, roughly translated as blood episodes, dealing with the exact process of how Bali must be offered to various forms of Shakti in order for the sadhana and the upasana to succeed. The text goes on to state that Bali Vidhan is the best of all methods of upasana for Chandika, Bhadrakali, Ugrachanda and other such forms of Shakti because it brings great delight to the Devi. From identifying the sacrificial animal to the worship of the Kharga involving appropriate mantras to the manner in which the blood has to be collected and offered to the deity, every single detail is mentioned. This was the Vamachara Tantra view on Bali. Let me now dwell on Pashubali under Vaidika Paramparas. The Mimangsakas, both the Bhattas and the Prabhakaras, as well as the Vedantins such as Shankara, Madhva, Bhaskara and their commentators, accept that though Bali is Himsa, there is no sin arising out of it. Others, such as Durgacharya, consider sacrificial killing to be Ahimsa as they call the killing of the animal its Rakshana or Abhyudaya, its welfare. The followers of Panchashikha in the Samkhya and Yoga schools, such as Konda Bhatta and grammarians, such as Nagesha, say that Bali is Himsa, but the sin incurred is Suparihara or easy to expiate. Therefore, scriptures as well as great authorities on Hindu Dharma, both Tantrika and Vaidika, have lent unequivocal support to Pashubali. On what grounds do modern Hindus oppose it? The voice of their conscience, we are often told. But here is a point to ponder. Barring a handful of states like Rajasthan and Gujarat, Indians, including Hindus, are predominantly non-vegetarian. Although India has a very low per capita consumption of meat, meat consumption in the last decade has grown nearly by 150%. 200 million land animals are slaughtered around the world every single day for commercial purposes. Yet, there does not seem to be any objection to this catastrophic consumerism. But having meat as prasad after it is offered to the deity in a handful of temples is singled out as a moral emergency. This madness must stop now. This is Rajushinandi for Upward.